All right, good morning, Three Circle. All of our campuses joining us right now. I want to welcome them in and all of those online. Great to have all of you here with us today. We're going to go into week two of our series to kick off the new year, which is David and Goliath. And as we dive into this, we failed to do this last week, and also we just all forgot about it. And then we it hit us in meetings this week that we probably should do this. So about four years ago, I got to write my first book. And when I wrote it, I wrote it on King Saul, one of the characters of this story we're talking about. Uh, as a kid, King Saul fascinated me, as did many people in the Bible, but for some reason he did because I thought no one's telling the story. And so I did a sermon series about five years ago on King Saul, uh, and people were really like, wow, we, sh we should do more with that. So we got to looking, and no one had written a book on just Saul and let him kind of have the focus and the dance floor, if you will, uh, in like 70 years. And so we wrote this book called Broken Crown, and we released it. And had a lot of fun with it, and the first edition we were done with, and about uh, three months ago, actually, we released the second edition of Broken Crown. And it's in hardback now, okay? So we're excited. It was only in paperback before. I got three excited people, and that's awesome. Um, but we went in, we added two chapters because... Uh, there's, there was some more stuff that we wanted to put in, so we added two chapters, and we put a study guide in the back of the book. So there's a study guide that goes along with each chapter. We're real proud of it. It's in hardback now, and it's available at every campus in our resource centers. And here's the deal. The proceeds of this book go to our initiative in Midtown Mobile for Midtown, okay? So I want you to know that. It's going there, but I would love for you to have this resource. We spent a lot of time and worked really hard. Uh, we want you to know more about King Saul's life, because I think when we look, we see a lot of King Saul in us, not just King David, right? We all want to see ourselves as the guy fighting the giant. I think a lot of times we're this, we're this guy, you know? And so I hope it'll help you. In particular, I'm just telling you, guys, if you're out there, there's a lot of things King Saul dealt with that we all deal with. And so check it out. It's out, out in the lobby. Now, let's dive in today to this David and Goliath series. Again, I want to give us the recap. David and Goliath is a story we're familiar with, but maybe we don't understand what all it means. David is not the hero of the story. Jesus is. David was pointing us to something greater. David's going to, to defeat a giant. Jesus is going to defeat death and hell and all of our greatest enemies. David will represent Israel in front of their enemy, Jesus on the cross represent, represented all believers before our greatest enemy, right? And so today we understand that this story is pointing us to Jesus. But it doesn't mean that we can't learn from the story in a million secondary ways. The first lesson we learned, Jesus is our champion, right? Jesus is our hero. But let's dive in and go, now what can we learn from this? And what we saw in week one, talking about King Saul, is that Israel was being led by a passive king. The Bible tells us Goliath was the champion of the Philistines. The Philistines were Israel's greatest enemy at that time. And they have invaded the country, which Saul should have been holding on to the borders. And he wasn't, because he was passive. And so at this point, Saul is a mess. His character is a mess. He's already been disqualified from being the king by God, but he still wears the crown. He's still sitting in the chair, all right? But what we learned last week is that the Bible tells us Goliath, the champion of the Philistines, the giant, stepped into the valley between the two armies and challenged one man to come out and fight him so that everybody else didn't have to fight. Don't think Goliath was a dumb old giant. That's what you were taught as a kid probably. Cool David with his sling and here comes the big old Goliath. That's how I would have taught it to a kid anyway. That's how I taught it to my kids. When we did. That was the sound I made, all right? But that's not the Goliath of the Bible. The Goliath of the Bible is an articulate, intelligent, educated man. He steps in, look at his speech, and he gives a great argument. He's like, we don't all have to do this. We know what ancient warfare looks like. I'm, I'm the champion of Philistine, of Philistine. Send me your champion. Who's he calling out? Saul. Because Philistine had a giant. His name was Goliath. So did Israel. And who was their giant? Saul. That's why they chose him. It was real simple when they were looking for a king. They didn't look for his political uh, intricacies. They didn't look for, that. I don't think anyone asked, is he smart? They're like, big, good looking guy. That's him. That's our king. The Bible says Saul was head and shoulders taller than anyone else in all of Israel. He was a giant. He was a huge man compared to everybody else in his country. That's who Goliath was calling out. And the Bible tells us for 40 days, morning and evening, Goliath stepped into that valley and challenged Saul come down and fight him. And Saul did nothing. 
because he's passive. He will not do anything. But Goliath messes up because on day 41 and moment 81, he steps into that valley and issues the challenge and a man of action hears him. As long as passive people hear about the problem, nothing's going to happen. But you let one person who's obedient and active hear it and something's going to happen. That's what happens when people lead. That's what happens when people take action. Look what happens. So the Bible tells us that uh, if you read the whole story, and I encourage you to do so, David is not even in the army. David is keeping his dad's sheep. His brothers, who his dad famously brings out before Samuel to be anointed, but not David, they're all in the army. So... The Bible tells us that David's dad, Jesse, says, David, I want you to take some food, some snacks to your brothers down at, the, down at the battle. And the Bible says he gives them grains and cheeses to take to his brothers. My youth pastor, who had a massive impact on me growing up, was a great communicator, and he preached a sermon, one of the ones I really remember, and the sermon was called Nacho Man, Nacho Man, because he looked at grains and cheeses, and he said, that's Doritos and queso, man. And I remember him talking to us teenagers, and his whole sermon was, I'm not your man, I'm God's man, not your man. You know, and it, I thought it was great, it was brilliant, I still remember it to this day, all right? That's good preaching, man, not your man. Anyway, the Bible tells us that David shows up to the battle with his, well, Doritos and queso, and he hears something. As he talked with the men, Verse 23, behold, the champion, the Philistine of Gath, Goliath by name, came up out of the ranks of the Philistines and spoke the same words as before. And I want you to underline this phrase. But this time, David heard them. And David heard him. Now, that's what happens when a man of action or a woman of action or a person of action hears of the, of the problem, of the challenge. Because up until that point, everybody's passive. Goliath thinks it'll be like every other day. 80 times Saul had heard the same thing. Saul's heard it day after day, morning, evening, and all the other people. No one else has stepped forward day after day. But it takes David one time, and you just need to know, this is the last time Goliath will ever challenge anyone. He will never challenge anyone again. Because he messed up, and he let a person who's obedient and active hear the challenge. So David heard him, and we all know David's going to do something because he's a person of action. And here's a principle I want us to learn today. Here it is. David's awareness of the challenge made him responsible to respond to it. That's how he believed. He heard it. He's got to do something about it. Saul didn't act that way. Passive people think that you can walk by problems. You can ignore problems. Maybe they go away. Someone else will take care of it. But obediently active people cannot do that. They cannot walk past a problem. We have a little phrase we use in my house. Use it a long time. And it's don't walk past a problem. Don't walk past a problem. We take care of problems. We do something about that. I can't tell you we do that perfectly all the time. There's a lot of messes that get left in my house. Well, they made the mess. And we're like, no, 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 no. We take care of the problem. It's just a little principle we have. That's the principle here. If I'm, aware, if I'm not aware, then I can't do anything about it. But once I'm aware... I've got responsibility as a person of God, a person put here to do something about it. One of the great lines from history is, evil things happen when good men and women sit by and do nothing. So what we have here is David sees this and he can't not do something. And may it be that we become people like that, that obediently are active, that we engage in the stuff around us, that we don't walk past problems. I'm gonna be honest with you, I love being a part of a church like ours. We are in, the. I think we're, this is the greatest church I've ever been a part of. I love our church because we just keep the yes card on the table. Let me give you an example. So I can't remember, I'm getting all the years wrong because there's so many now. We've been here so long that I can't remember them all. But a long time ago, it feels like now, um, we, we became three circles. So this church was founded by Pastor Mike Meganson, who's still a part of our team, love him so much. And it started as Bay Area Baptist with an incredible group of people. And then it became Church on the Eastern Shore. And then we, we call it Three Circle for our vision. And we said we're going to be local, regional, global. And God started stirring our hearts because we were so global in our reach. But 
we wanted to do more locally and regionally. And one day in our old worship center, I stood up there and I said, hey, we are not going to keep getting on planes and going across oceans when we're not willing to get in our cars and go across a bay. I thought that was a good line, man. I think Russell Creel gave it to me, okay, but whatever. So anyway, that's, we all got stirred up about it. And then God started kind of moving our hearts towards Mobile and what, we, what could happen there. So we started making some calls. And one day, I get a call from a guy who I had preached at his church a bunch of times when I lived in Atlanta. I drive over to Tuscaloosa where he was a pastor and I preach at his church. I get a call and it's my buddy Phil Boyles uh, on the other end of the line. And he says, hey, Chris, how are you? I said, man, I'm good, Phil. He said, why are, you, uh, why are you calling everybody else? You hadn't called me. I, I, did, I had no idea what he was talking about. I said, Phil, I'm, I'm sorry. He said, well, I hear that you're wanting to do something over in Mobile. Why hadn't you called me? And I was like, well, Phil, Tuscaloosa's a long way from Mobile. He said, I'm not in Tuscaloosa anymore. I'm at Sage Avenue Baptist Church in Mobile, and you got to know Pastor Phil. He's so honest. He's such an honest guy. He goes, and this place is dying, man. And I said, really? He said, yeah, God brought me here. I got no idea why he brought me here until I heard what you guys were up to. I think I know why God brought me here. See, he's a man of action. And, I, and I'm going to be honest with you. The, the Midtown story has lots of heroes, Jesus being the greatest. The Midtown Mobile Campus story that we have over there. And what God's doing there is unbelievable. I am not one of the heroes of the story because I thought it was going to be too hard the whole time. The whole time I thought, what in the world is God leading us to do here? So Phil was the first one to go, we need to talk. So we talked. He said, man, our church, we, every, over the years, people just kept moving away. And we're in the middle of ministry central. We're in the middle of the, one of the most diverse areas in the entire state. But everyone moved out. And there's a handful of people here at this church. Will you meet with us? So me and Mike Magnuson, founding pastor of this church, get in our car, and we go over one night, and we met with a group of deacons and elders, older men and Phil Boyle sitting in this little room. As we drove up, 78,000 square feet of buildings are in disrepair, not being used, right in the middle of thousands of people and families and kids not being reached, not being helped. And so we walked in there, and for two hours, I listened to this group of men with tears in their eyes tell me that their own dads, many of them, way back, had, had been a part of giving the money to build these buildings. And they said, we don't know what to do, but we want this place to continue to be a ministry. And we don't know what to do. We don't know how to make it happen, but we don't want to lose this place. We don't want it to turn into something else. We want this to be something God uses. And they were telling us this, and the whole time I'm sitting there going, well, this is, this is tough. This, what in the world, this is so tough. So we listen to them and we get in the car. Me and Mike Megson didn't say a word to each other all the way through downtown Mobile. We get out on the Bayway and finally I'm going down the road and I look over at Mike and I said, exactly how it went down. I said, do you think we should do this? A part of me is like, we're not doing this, right? This is crazy. He looked at me and he goes, Chris, how can we not do this? And I said, well, I guess we're doing this. Yes card was on the table. We did not know how. One of the hardest things ever. But that's what happens when, when people go, we can't walk past that. And so what happens today on Sunday mornings looks like this. It's just a little snapshot, but this happens every Sunday now. A church full of people, fam the most diverse, beautiful church you've ever seen. After school programs, now the Forum uh, Midtown Initiative. Kids are getting discipled, getting needs met for schools, families. I mean, it is generational what's happening there. Men and women like Micah Gaston and his wife moved there to be a part of it. Marcel Joseph and his amazing amazing wife, Whitney, moved up from Orlando, caught the vision. And, and all it took was a church over in Baldwin County saying, our yes card is on the table, God. We don't know how, but it's a yes, whatever you ask us to do. And I'm just here to tell you, I am not the guy, I like, I, there were a lot of people around me that, that could see it better than I could. But what God's doing there is amazing. Why? Because we didn't walk past the problem. And that is true. We got to be people like that. In our lives, if we're aware, we got to do something about it. So here's what I want to warn you of, though. I want us to be inspired by this story and empowered by God to become people of obedient action. 
I don't want us to be passive. I don't want you to be a passive husband or wife. I don't want passive moms and dads. I don't want to be a passive person. I don't want you to either. I don't want us to ever be a passive church. But I need to warn us. There's consequences to becoming active. It doesn't always go the way you want it to. Because I want you to know that if you wait for the applause, it may never come. In fact, you and I are going to have to be committed like David had to be committed to the applause of one. we got to start living as individuals, families, and churches for the applause of one. Because the applause of the crowd may not come. Let me prove it to you. No one believed in David but God. His own daddy didn't. Look at 1 Samuel 16, 11, when God was looking for the next king, wanting to anoint the next king, he sends the prophet Samuel to Jesse's house. But Jesse only brings out the brothers, not David. Samuel said to Jesse, are all your sons here? And he said, well, there remains yet the youngest, but behold, he's keeping the sheep. Samuel said to Jesse, send and get him, for we will not sit down until he comes here. And that's when you know that old dude was serious. Because he's like, we're not sitting down until you bring that boy in here. And you know the story. They bring David in and God says to Samuel, there he is. That's the one. But I want you to notice, David's father wrongly questioned his qualification. He did not even believe his, that David had a shot. He didn't think he was qualified. And if you begin to take obedient action in your life, you need to know there'll be people around you the same way. You need to understand that passive people are made very uncomfortable by active people. You get serious about your family. You get serious about changing your life. You get serious about putting your yes card on the table for God instead of your yes card on the table for this culture. And you will not get the applause you think you will get. You'll get some strange looks. You'll get pressure to conform. You're going to have to get used to being questioned. His own dad was like, well, it can't be him. Oh, it's him. Surely it's not him. He's out there with the sheep. That's my farm boy. It's got to be one of these. No, 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 no. Not only that, when David shows up with <clears throat> his Doritos and queso, I can't get away from it, y'all. I cannot get it. It's just too good. When he shows up with that, his own brothers who were there, the soldiers, the fighters, well, they didn't believe in him either. Look what it says, verse 26. David said to the men who stood by, so remember, he heard Goliath, And what does a person of action do? All of them had been hearing it for 40 days, 80 times. But on day 41 and time 81, David heard it. And David said to the men who stood by him, what shall be done? And just stop right there. That's what active people sound like right there. It took him one time to see the problem and hear the problem. And he's already saying, we got to do something. What are we going to do? We're not going to just sit here, right? Something has to be done. Do you know if all of us start living like that, we will turn this world upside down? Do you know what our homes and our families and our communities will look like if we start looking at the issues around us and become a people that says, what shall be done? It'll change the world, guys, by the power of God. I got one person excited, and that's all I need. He says, what shall be done for the man who kills this Philistine, that he should defy the armies of the living God? And and, and I love this. He didn't just say Philistine. He said, Circumcised Philistine. That, I, you got to love David, right? He, he brings up the, the, the personal here, and he says, he should defy the armies of the living God. And the people answered him in the same way. So shall it be done to the man who kills him. Now watch this. His older brother is there. Now Eliab, his eldest brother, heard when he spoke to the men. And Eliab's anger was kindled against David. And he said, why have you come down? And with whom, look at this, and with whom have you left those few sheep in the wilderness? You think that was a brotherly jab right there? Mm Mm-hmm. I know your presumption and the evil in your heart, for you've come down to see the battle. So he is calling him evil. And David said, what have I done now? You see some history, some family history going on there, right? Was it not but a word? And he turned away from him toward another and spoke in the same way, and the people answered him again as before. So David's brother wrongly questioned his motives. His daddy questions his qualification, his brother. And this is what, pa- I want you to notice this. David's brother is passive. David's brother has heard the same thing 80 times that David heard how many times? 
and he has done nothing. Nothing. History, I love history. History is littered with passive people. It's how slavery existed for hundreds of years. It's how the Nazis ruled most of Europe for 15 to 20 years. It's how the greatest evils that have ever been perpetuated on this planet were able to happen because people sat back and did nothing. That's how it happens. David hears it one time. But notice how passive people act. Often, passive people, when you get active, will get literally angry at you about it. They should have been applauding David. Oh, no, no. They're going to question. Now he's arrogant. Now he's prideful. You might think that when we started the Midtown Mobile campus in Urban Mobile and how hard that was, you might think that all the pastors in the area were like, "Woo! just blowing my phone up. Brother, we're behind you. I actually had a longtime pastor whose church stood less than 10 minutes from where our Midtown campus is. Look at me in front of a group of people one day without calling my name, but look right at me. They knew. And he said this. He said, these churches, starting churches and all that instead of their own church and going outside, he said, that's nothing but pride and arrogance. And he looked right at me when he said it. <clears throat> that was about a year into it. Now, fleshly Chris, who I try to keep in the cage... <laughs> Wanted to come out real bad. You ever have conversations in your mind that you don't let out? But I, boy, I had a line. But in my heart, I thought, because I, I knew this guy. He'd been at his church over 25 years, less than 10 minutes away. And I wanted, in my heart, I wanted to say, brother, you've been, you watched this church die for 25 years and you hadn't lifted a finger. And we come in and try to do something and just bring it to life. And you're mad about it? We're prideful and arrogant? That's exact, that's Eliab. And all I'm doing, I'm not, I'm not saying to make, look, I told you, I'm not the hero of the story anyway. A lot of other people believed in it in the beginning more than I did. But what I do want you to see is this is the reaction. You're probably not going to get this when you start actively obeying God. You're going to get a lot of pushback, a lot of questioning. Not only that, when David gets finally to the king, King Saul, the passive king, well, he doesn't think he can do it. Saul says to David in verse 33, you are not able to go against this Philistine to fight with him for you are but a youth. He's been a man of war from his youth. Oh, that's real rich coming from the guy who won't do anything about it. Right? So here's what we got. We got King Saul who won't do a thing looking at David and going, well, you can't do anything. So basically the guy who says, I won't do anything, now looks at a person who wants to take action and says, you can't do anything. That's how it works, man. This is human behavior on display. This is what it looks like. The man of action, the woman of action gets told, you're not qualified, you, you've got bad motives, or either you can't do this. Too big, too much. See, King Saul wrongly questioned David's ability. He didn't think he could do it. But the Bible tells us the problem was they were all looking at the wrong thing. Passive people always look at circumstances. Passive people look at circumstances and see them as insurmountable and see them as impossible. Active, proactive, engaged people see the world differently. 1 Samuel 16, 7, God told him. God said to Samuel, don't look on his appearance or on the height of his stature because I've rejected him. For the Lord sees not as man sees. Man looks on the outward appearance. The Lord looks on the heart. God can see things we can't see. That's why we must just put our unqualified yes on the table for him. Because Midtown did not make sense, just like Daphne didn't make sense for Three Circle, and Robert Stell didn't make sense, and what, I mean, it, nothing makes sense. Sometimes. I'm convinced if, if it makes sense, it's probably not obedient enough. That's what I've learned in my life, at least. Because God likes to shove us out on the limb sometimes. God warns us to not look at the outside or the circumstances to trust him and obey. 
David was very confident. What in the world would make a young man this confident? He tells us. He's looking at Saul in verse 36 and 37. And by the way, if you're here and you've got a mahogany office, two four-wheel drives and a bunch of bucks hanging on your wall, I, I feel you, man. I get you. I like that stuff too. But we got nothing on this guy. Because here's the line. You ready? Your servant has struck down both lions and bears, and we can just stop right there. He wins. You win, David, because he doesn't have a high-powered rifle, just so you know. He doesn't have a scope. Binoculars. He's got rocks and hands. He says, I've struck down lions and bears. <laughs> Here comes David again, and this uncircumcised Philistine will be like one of them. In other words, I got a lion and a bear on the wall, and I'm about to put a giant on there. Watch this, for he has defied the armies of the living God. Now, just before you think he's a prideful little kid, look what he says. David says, the Lord. Everyone say the Lord. And he's about to go theological on us. The Lord who delivered me from the paw of the lion and from the paw of the bear will deliver me from the hand of the Philistine. Saul said to David, go and the Lord be with you. David, we believe in progressive revelation. The Bible gets clearer as you keep flipping the pages. David just introduced a concept about God for us that the apostles will fully flesh out in the New Testament. And it's the theological attribute of God known as immutability. You know what that means? God does not change. Look what David says in his land. He's not a theologian. He's a young man, but here's what he says. You ready? He says, God delivered me from a bear and a lion, so he will deliver me from the giant. Because God doesn't change. This is good news. You ready? you're not going to wake up tomorrow to a different version of God. Ever. Ever. He will never change. So David trusted God's faithfulness in the present because he had experienced God's faithfulness in the past. How many of you in this room and online and everywhere would say, I have experienced God's faithfulness in the past. Have any of you ever seen him to be faithful? Watch this. Then he will be now and he will be tomorrow. He will be faithful. And that's good news. That's, that's what David's saying. Now, here's the thing you need to know about passive people. You're about to see it in Saul. And he is not unique. Passive people, once they get over the fact that you've made them mad by making them uncomfortable and taking action, will then cheer you on. They'll say, go ahead. But watch this. Passive people will still try to become your consultant. Do you know that? Passive people that don't want to do anything, be glad for you to step into the arena. Teddy Roosevelt warned us of this in his most famous speech. He said, the man in the arena is the one that counts, not the guy in the, in the stands telling him how to do it, critiquing him on how to do it. So what Saul does is looks at a young man and says, go fight him, but fight him my way. Look at this, 1 Samuel 17, 38. Then Saul clothed David with his armor. He put a helmet of bronze on his head, clothed him with a coat of mail, David strapped his sword over his armor. He tried in vain to go, for he had not tested them. Then David said to Saul, I cannot go with these. I've not tested them. Here's another great thing you see with David. So he put them off. Active people don't waste time. There's not time to be wasted. So David tried to honor Saul, but he said, I can't do this. I can't wear this. Now let's remember how foolish all this is. Saul is the largest man in Israel. No one can wear his armor, number one. Number two, what armor is going to protect you from a 10-foot man with a sword if you're going into hand-to-hand -hand combat? Nothing. David looks at Saul and he goes, I, I can't do this. You're try you don't want to do anything, but when someone does something, you want them to do it your way. Gotcha. David said, I can't do that. That's not how we're going to roll. So he put them off. In fact... When you look at David's life, he refuses, he refuses to walk in Saul's shoes. There's four big things David refuses about Saul. He refuses first to lead like Saul. He will not do it. Saul is passive. David is active and obedient. He refuses to dress like Saul. He's not going to wear, he's not going to wear any armor. He's never had, he's a shepherd. He wasn't wearing armor when he fought a lion. So he's not going to wear it today. It's not who he is. He refuses to fight like Saul. Saul is a hand-to-hand -hand 
combat fighter. That's all he knows how to do. What does David know how to do? David is an assassin. He is a slingshot expert. So David's like, I'm not using a sword, man. I got my weapon. I know how to do it. I'm going to fight the way God's uniquely designed me to fight. We'll get there next week. And in the end, David just refuses to live like Saul. Because Saul's not obedient. And David won't be his whole life either, but we're not looking down, we're looking at him right now. And in this moment of his life, this is an obedient young man, and he is living in the overflow of his obedience. He refuses to live like Saul. But here's the thing I don't want you to miss today David was wearing armor. People don't realize that. Everybody tells a story, and they say he went against Goliath, he wasn't wearing armor. Oh, yes, he was. You just can't see it. There's two times I see in today's passage where David points us to greater theological truths. First was what? The immutability of God. He doesn't change. The second is David is pointing us to a New Testament concept that the Apostle Paul detailed for us, and it's called the armor of God. Listen, David was wearing the armor of the Lord. Next week, we will see him stand before the giant, and what will he say? You come to me with your sword and your shield and your armor and all that. I come to you in the name of the Lord. David was wearing armor. He just didn't know how to articulate it the way Paul will under the inspiration of the Holy Spirit in the New Testament. Remember, Paul talked about what David was wearing that day. He said in Ephesians 6, finally be strong in the, and in the strength of his might, put on the whole armor of God that you may be able to stand against the schemes of the devil for we do not wrestle against flesh and blood but against rulers, authorities, cosmic powers over this present darkness against spiritual forces of evil in the heavenly places. And then he goes on, Paul does in Ephesians, to give us this picture of the armor of the Lord. Look at it. Helmet, breastplate, shield, belt, sword, shoes. What do they all have in common? They are spiritual. These are spiritual components. Because you need to understand this. You're in a battle that requires more than your armor can handle. The question today is this. As you become an active person of God, what are you trusting in? Saul trusted the what? His armor. David trusted the who? What's your armor that you trust in? A little too much. Let's be honest for a second. Do you trust your money? I hear that a lot of people in Baldwin County have some. Do you trust your abilities, your education? How about your connections? You know people. You can make stuff happen. What do you trust in? What are you teaching your kids to trust in? Their abilities, their popularity, their athletic prowess, their artistic endeavors. What do we trust in? What's your chariot and horse? What's your sword and shield? Here's what I promise you. If you trust in Saul's armor, your own armor, you're going to end up with an enemy that is too big for your armor. You must trust in the Lord. We must trust in the Lord. And what will it take today for you and I to transfer the trust we're putting in all these things, our armor, and put it in the Lord and the power of his might? What would that look like today for you and for me? Let's pray together. Jesus, thank you for your word today. Please help us to live it out, to hear and to act, to obey. Please help us to do that. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen.